the second stage then is the carding of it um, and this is sort of basically the first stage of sort of aligning all your fibers and getting them ready to be spun or perhaps to be combed as I said before depending on the process I'll just give you a quick look at this get it's the reason I'm doing this is because again this is manual so a machine does the same thing but much more efficiently it's about understanding the process because you can't look for benefits or uh, improvements in the way in which you process something unless you understand the process so having a holistic view of how cotton is carded as part of it so basically you've got two two paddles there which have these uh, metal pins on them and it's simply a process of sort of applying pressure on one here we go here she goes she's just sort of starting to turn it into something which can be workable or spun slowly first stage of uh, like combing your hair if you like getting the major knots out and as such uh, have I got one I might have one here also for okay this is a carding machine that's mechanical same process but obviously can pr can do it much more quicker the the point I, I wanted to illustrate to you here is you'll notice that there is no people in it or there are but they're behind the camera at the moment um, it's a capital intensive process you don't need people you just need money to buy the machines and electricity to run them so the positives are it's much more efficient obviously the negatives are it doesn't employ people or not many and it requires electricity which may or may not come from a coal burning source it just depends the combing I'm going to introduce you again this is the finer processing particularly for um, finer yarns and fabrics you use this process and I'll introduce you into someone who does it manually and I'll explain why I'm showing you her in a moment folks way back when I won't tell you the year I want to show you the proper way to do wool combing to make it easy sure. and fast for you so you don't get 50% waste if you watch real close you'll see first of all you can set the wool comb down on your table or on your knee but if you're worried about being careful the beginning there's a lock it has a tip and it has a cut side this is some awesome tunas from Kentucky you load it like this if you get a chance to see it this hand is the non-moving hand over the handle hand handle this one right here you just slide her down like this just barely catching the tips of the tines barely catching the tips cut side onto the tines just load this up hey as a beginner don't put too much on it's a little tough otherwise so load this little baby up ta-da hardly any on the back side nope don't my awesome ring too isn't that pretty cool I made that this weekend all right combing hold it in your left hand your right-handed and your right hand if you're left-handed so start like this, make sure your thumb is up against the comb handle, turn it towards you, and go perpendicular. You go from your stomach away, from your stomach away, and you cut through these locks till they all, the majority of them, move to the moving comb. So you have just hardly any left on here. If you have some left on here and you don't like that, you can turn the tines down, cut across again, turn them up, cut across again, get as much as you can. The next move is quite simple. Don't change your combs. Keep everything right where it is and move it ceiling to floor. Or in this way, sky to the ground, sky to the ground. Hope you can hear those wonderful birds as I sit here on the deck of uh, Shaker Village here in uh, Shakertown, Kentucky, outside Harrodsburg. Oh, by the way, that Ann McGintry. She's one of the spinners that's located up in the Harrodsburg Fort uh, Cemetery at Fort Harrods. We want to go next time we get around here. 
Yeah, go, go. Okay, as you can see, she is pretty happy doing what she does. Um, the last stage in the process is the spinning of the fibres uh, so that we can get our yarn that's going to be ready to be woven or turned into a knit. And again, I'll just show you another manual process. Obviously, I'll sped up with that. I won't show you the whole thing. Hi, I'm Shandy of ExpressionFiberArts.com and I'm going to show you today how to spin yarn. It's way awesome. If you're a knitter or a crocheter or a weaver and you want to take your craft to the next level and just be way cool and way awesome, you have to try spinning. It's the coolest thing to be able to make yarn and then you take that yarn and make it into something else. It's mind blowing. It's just so cool. You can do so many colors, so many options. You can do multiple plies. You can use a drop spindle or a wheel. Um, I use a wheel because it's so much faster and I like to get things done and be productive, but there's just so many options and it's, it's so exciting, but it's also so meditative and centering and you just zone out the world. It's an escape is what it is. I love it. I think you'll love it too if you haven't tried it already. If you have, hopefully you'll learn something new in the video anyway. So I'm super excited to show you. So let's get started. Woo! I'm using my Lendrum Saxony 28 inch double treadle wheel today. I've got it out on the dock. The lake is beautiful. The sun is shining. You look, you don't have to spin on a lake. You can do it inside your room or in a factory. Um, but I think it's up here somewhere. Here we go. Okay, so there's our combed or carded yarn. She's going to load it up. So as as the wheel spins, uh, it feeds or pulls the yarn in, and she just controls how quick or how slowly it gets fed in, and that that gives you the consistency in in the yarn. Um, the energy to turn that wheel comes from her feet, so it's a foot pedal. So this one doesn't release any carbon or emissions of any sorts and is meditative and calm. So you can say from a social point of view, it's wonderful and fantastic. However, if you're filling an order for 20,000 units for Kmart, uh, it's obviously not a practical way to do it. So the question is, is there a middle, middle ground between the application of technology or capital intensive production methods and labor intensive production methods? So, as I said before, if we do go for the capital intensive methods, um, in both developed and developing nations, machinery is used in place of people. So, as you recall, when we looked at raw materials and growing cotton, in the developed world of the wealthiest nations, it was capital intensive, where you used machinery to do that. In the developing world, where wages were low, you used people to grow the cotton. At this stage of the product life cycle, the fabric and textile production, it's all machinery regardless of where you are in the world because it's simply more, more efficient at doing so. So there's not much in the way of sort of innovative change to this process in terms of environmental damage except for the source of the electricity or consuming less electricity for each particular machine. Um, if we look at some of the reports that have been written, so this one from Andrew Barbara and Glenis Pello, they looked at how much energy is required, so electricity is required to spin certain fibres, and as you can see by the chart there, the, the um, synthetics take a significant amount of electricity compared to the natural fibres. So one argument you could have for using natural fibres in your range is that when it comes to the spinning of those fibers you use you know a quarter of the electricity that perhaps the nylons and acrylics would use 
Equally, if we look at this other chart where we have the crop and fibre production of hemp and cotton versus polyester, we'll see right at the end here in the US, this is kilograms of CO2 emissions per tonne of fibre spun. Polyester requires the most amount of electricity and therefore generates the most amount of CO2 emissions. As we go down to lower emission levels, we're moving into the natural products, hemp, cotton, organic hemp, um, spun in a traditional manner here. So one argument to follow Jenny's wheel spinning uh, process is that it would use a lot less electricity. But the consequence of that is consistency in the quality of the fibre is going to be different if you use handmade. Now, if your customer will accept that, that's fine. But if they won't, they'll just classify your garments as being weak or poor. And that will erode confidence in your brand. Um, if we look at China, uh, China produces a five-year, the Chinese government produces a five-year plan uh, for the entire country and it basically sets out the targets of what it wants to achieve in those five years and then will allocate resources for it to occur. So in the latest five-year plan, the 2016 to 2020 plan, the Chinese government basically announced to industry that they wanted more value adding in the products that they produced. So no more cheap garments, but more valuable garments were to be produced. And they wanted the value to be added with the application of technology. So if we go back to that initial video where we looked at the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we see that the Chinese government is pushing or moving along that line of saying, let's use technology to make better products. Now, how that applies to the fashion industry uh, it depends on which segment you're in, in that in industry. But uh, basically for fashion in particular in China, or textiles I should say, um, they looked at the electricity consumption or energy consumption as well as water for those two, uh, for that sector. Uh, so if you look at this chart here, which is a bit confusing, but this is the amount, uh, the energy to run the textiles industry in China. So in 1990, if we look at that, more than 65% of the energy came from burning coal or coke, which is a cleaner form of coal, like charcoal, if you like. Uh, and then some of the sector used petrol, natural gas, and then electricity, which could have, uh, which comes, may have come from coal as well. But the direct burning of coal to run the textiles industry was up to 65%. If you look at that trend, you'll notice over the years it's been going down. So as as the factories become more efficient, as they apply the technology um, into their processes, they start to become cleaner as an industry. And that trend is continuing to go down, the burning of coal, and it's being substituted by using electricity. As I said, it's a little bit confusing because the electricity that they're using may still come from coal, but it's not direct. In this way, there's a direct, they knew exactly um, uh, where the burning of the coal was occurring to, to run that factory. Now it's slightly uh, removed. So the point of that is you've got one of the major players in the world that's moving away from using coal, is conscious of the consequences of using coal, CO2 emissions, is moving away from it. So it might mean that we, we find Chinese manufacturers who are at the cutting edge of energy efficiency when it comes to spinning and weaving and source from them. We plug them into our supply chain so we have a greener or more efficient supply chain. Um, if we look 